What up guys, what's happening? Welcome to Creating Space in our incredibly beautiful new studio here at Wheelhouse Media Studios in the heart of Charlotte. Super excited to be joined by an absolute badass, an animal might be a better word. She is the number one ranked paratriathlete in the United States and the number seventh ranked in the world. This is Amy Dixon. Amy, welcome to the show. Welcome to Charlotte. So excited that you're here. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. This is this is truly um, incredible. You you got to push to Tokyo 2020. It, it, I mean, we're like eight <laughs> months to go. Don't you're in the straightaway, that. in the back end. Um, <laughs> yeah. To start off, let's talk about why you're here in Charlotte. Let's let's talk about your current focus right now, and then we'll build into that. Yeah. So uh, I have two amazing friends, uh, Susie and Nick Trevisano, who live here in Charlotte, and. I reached out to them a few months ago and said, hey, you know, we, we know each other through the wine industry. I spent 20 years working as a sommelier, which is how I met them. And I had this, you know, harebrained idea to maybe put together an intimate dinner party with some of their friends that are interested, interested in wine and doing a fundraiser. And Susie and Nick took it to 1,000%. And yeah. it, it's been a whirlwind tour of Charlotte since I've gotten here. And uh, we've had two amazing uh, fundraising dinners and events and met hundreds of people that have been so supportive. Yeah, you said when you came in today, you had like something like 1,600, maybe more feet of elevation incline today uh, yeah, when you a little were training? Bit. Yeah, this morning, was a little <laughs> so, rough. Well, this morning was a little rough. I was like, Charlotte is not flat, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so there's been just sort of two experiences of Charlotte, a good yeah. and a bad, so yeah, to speak. Yeah, no, Excellent. Good. All good. Um, so 2020, right? Mm. Um, Tokyo, a push that inevitably started at 22 years old. Mm -hmm. So let's get into the mix of it. 22 years old, you're, um, you're where, doing what? Um, and let's talk about kind of that, that moment in your life, the start. Yeah, so I was uh, paying my way through the University of Connecticut, trying to get my doctorate in pharmaceuticals, uh, working as a, a wine steward in a restaurant. When at night I started having trouble, I was started bumping into tables. Uh, I would go to pour wine and miss the glass. All of our bus boys wore these hunter green polo shirts and I was smashing into them and they thought I was just being a jerk and not paying attention. And um, I remember I was living with my college boyfriend at the time. My mom came to visit me and I was covered in bruises. And she said, honey, you can tell me if he's hurting you. And I said, Whoa. I promise. I'm like, he's not. She goes, nobody has that many bruises. I said, I swear I'm really clumsy. And he's you know, saying the same thing. And she goes, I don't know, something's up. And the, the nail in the coffin was we had a, a Labrador at the time that uh, slept at the top of the stairs. And I swore that I looked and I didn't see him. And I, I tripped over him and I fell down the stairs and broke my ribs. And so that was the moment that my family said, listen, something's clearly going on. You need to go see a doctor. And I had no health insurance at the time, so I really couldn't afford it because working in the restaurant business, you don't usually get health insurance right. uh, waiting tables. So uh, I saved up my tips for about a month before I could finally go see my neurologist because I thought that maybe this had to do something with my headaches. I suffered from migraines from the time I was nine years old. Mm. And so I had what was called strobing and flashing or called photopsia going on at the time where everything was cutting in and out like a camera that was sh sh opening and shutting. And I thought it was because I was overtired. It was midterms at school. I was burning the candle at both ends, working until one o'clock in the morning, getting up at five and driving to the university every day. So, you know, you just don't think anything's really wrong with you. And my vision was totally clear. It was 2020 straight ahead, no problems reading, no problems recognizing faces, none of that. So I didn't think it was a vision problem. I thought it was a headache problem. So I went to my neurologist. Um, and I saw him and the first thing he did was held his hands out to the side like this. And he says, how many fingers am I holding up? And I said, your arms are missing. And he goes, oh, come on, kiddo. Because I'd known him for 10, 15 years at that point. And he goes, don't joke around. I said, no, no, really, it's like a curtain. You know, there's a like black line and your arms are just gone. And he goes, okay. He calls his secretary and he says, Amy and I are gonna go for a little walk. We'll be back in about an hour. And so I'm like, where are we going? So he marched me downstairs because he knew I would have left because uh, I had no money to go see another <laughs> doctor. I was yeah. like, this is all the $200 that I have. and. Uh, uh, he marched me downstairs to an ophthalmologist and plopped me in the chair and, and made them take a look at me. And they all sort of talked amongst themselves and whispered where, where I could. I'm like, I can hear you. <laughs> and, and so finally. So are you trembling? Are you in fear in this I'm moment? Sort of are you recognizing? confused yeah. and baffled and kind of angry because it's now about four o'clock on a Friday afternoon and I have to be at the restaurant in 30 minutes. And so, mm. you know, this is not the days of cell phones and things like that. Hurry so, up, guys. I'm trying to get to work. Yeah, I was yeah. like, guys, I'm going to get fired. It's Friday night. It's the biggest night of the week in the restaurant business. It's like, this is my money night. I need to be there. Right. And, uh, and so they're like, no, no, this is really important. You know, I'm like, well, why? I see, fine. Why am I here? And um, so they said, well, we've seen this in a journal once. 
<laughs> which is never something you want to hear. Um, and we think it's this disease called multifocal choroiditis. And I looked at them like they had two heads. And uh, they asked me if I had been sick recently. And I thought, well, that's an odd thing to ask since we're talking about my eyesight. And I said, well, yeah, I had a sinus infection about five, six weeks ago. And they, they all sort of you know, shook their heads and nodded. And I was like, can you guys sort of clue me in on what's going on? And they said, well, just sit tight. We're waiting for the specialist to drive up from New York City. Now, mind you, it's Friday afternoon. I'm in Connecticut. Rush hour traffic on a Friday is a nightmare. I'm like, when is this guy going to grace us with his presence? <laughs> so I'm sitting there. I was stuck there till 7 o'clock at night waiting for this guy. Finally, I beg them to let me use the phone to call my boss. And I'm in tears because I'm thinking I'm going to get fired. They're talking that I'm going to lose my eyesight and that this, I have this terrible disease. It's going to make me blind within a year and there's no treatment. And this doctor finally comes up and he takes a look and he goes, yeah, he goes, that's what it is. And I, and I literally, like, I stood up. I said, I've been here for four hours. I am done, you know, being a punk 22-year-old. Sure. Sure. I was like, you guys are full of crap. And I marched out of the office and I, I got to the restaurant finally and I was in tears and I t told my boss what was happening. And I started, I'm like, they don't know what they're talking about. I see just fine. They, sure. They're crazy. And so I continued like that for another month or two. Um, and I had a couple near misses while driving late, late at night coming home because I was developing cataracts, which is another symptom of the disease, wow. where I was having a hard time with glare. And so I was back roads to get home at night and this car was coming and I couldn't see the road. And so I ended up in a ditch. I was okay, but I thought, God, I'm like, okay, this is just stupid. Like, clearly I need to do something. So what does a 22-year-old kid do? She calls her pediatrician, you know, because that's... <laughs> Because I'd known him for, you know, sure. 22 years, and, and he's like my, my dad or my grandfather. And I'm like, Dr. Barth, they say I'm going to go blind. I don't, I don't know what's going on, but, it's like, I'm clearly having problems. I'm really struggling. I've got to work because I, I can't afford school if I don't work. And so he was kind enough to do some research on the disease and found the gentleman that named the disease and, and uh, discovered it, if you will, that happened to be in New York City. And I lived in Connecticut at the time, and, and he's, so he got me an appointment. And I, again, saved up all my tips. They told me it was going to be $1,000 for this visit. I was like, that is a lot of money. Right. <laughs> That's like two months rent at the time. And uh, so I finally get down there and I meet Dr. Yanuzi. And he said, you know, he, he confirmed the diagnosis and said, yeah, you're going to lose your sight. He goes, our goal here is to, to slow it down enough that technology catches up with the disease. So at what rate at this time is your eyesight dwindling? So a normally sighted person from right to left and top to bottom has 180 degrees of peripheral vision. Okay. I lost about 70% of that peripheral vision by because I waited so long to go to the doctor And that's initially. like eight weeks, something so, like yeah. that? Yeah, so it was pretty quick. Wow. So they were sure that it was going to be gone within a year with, the, with the, how quickly it was progressing. But fortunately, I got in to see Dr. Yanuzi when I did, and they put me on high-dose st steroid treatment. So it's, it's an inflammatory disease of the retina that's triggered by a cold, a virus, uh, in my case, a sinus infection, and it's a, just a heightened immune system. My sister had lupus and had already been diagnosed, mm. so they said that's sort of part of this disease family. And um, so the goal was to shut down my immune system and combat the inflammation by putting me on high-dose steroids, which have a lot of side effects on their own, but they work very, very well at what they're supposed to do. Sure. And so, but unfortunately, they can't differentiate in your body where they need to go, so they go everywhere. Right. And so he put me on that, and he said, "Okay, well, I'll see you back in a week." And I said, "Whoa!" whoa, whoa. I said, "This is my one and done appointment. You've yeah, got yeah. all my money. <laughs> like, this is two months rent." And he goes, "Are you paying cash?" And I said, "Yeah, yeah." He goes, "He just sort of shook his head and kind of smiled. He was like in his seventies, a very nice gentleman." And he he goes come with me. So he walks me out to the billing office and it's, it's this huge office on Park Avenue in New York City. It's very fancy and there's a lot of old Jewish ladies in the lobby who are like, oh honey, what are you here for? And I'm like, <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, you're too young and too pretty to have something wrong with your eyes. And I was like, so it was hilarious. And so I really stuck out in this office and so he marches me through all these women and takes me to the billing office and he goes, she doesn't pay until I can fix her. Wow. I was like, Oh, okay. Our, okay. He goes, so I'll see you next week. And, I, and that was it. And he kept his promise and he kept well, treating let's, me. Let's talk about that moment when you're leaving there, now Oof. knowing there's a diagnosis and yeah. you know how quickly your vision is shrinking. Let's talk about that fear like that's running through your body oh. at that time. Can you take us back to that moment? Well, I remember being on the train and I, I remember going into the subway in Grand Central and seeing panhandlers who were blind. Mm. And I was like, Oh my God, Yeah. like this is gonna, like I didn't know anybody who was blind. I didn't know anybody that, who was blind and functioning, sure. let alone certainly not an athlete. <laughs> like that was certainly not in my wheelhouse at the time. 
And so I was like, oh my gosh, I'm gonna be living on the streets. Or I'm gonna have to move back in with my mom. I haven't lived at home since I was 17. And I, I love my mom, but I had no aspirations <laughs> of going back there. And so I thought, I'm like, how am I gonna work? How am I gonna get paid? Like, this is, this is the worst, it was the worst sure. thing I could possibly imagine. And so I treated myself into cannoli, into a cannoli at Zara's Bakery, and drowned my sorrows in sugar on the on the train ride home back to Connecticut, and tried to figure out like how am I going to tell my boss? Like, wow. I so, you know, going back to the restaurant, and so he was kind enough to say, listen, like we'll move your shifts to day shifts because it's a little brighter for you to see. And I mean, they did everything they could to try to help me, and uh, you know, try to find friends that lived in the area that I did so I could commute home with them at night if I did have to work at night. Yeah. Cause that was where the money was. I wasn't going to, I was going to make $30 at lunch and I could make $300 at dinner. It was like, you know, I really need to work at night sure. so I could pay my rent. Sure. And, um, so, so were you like think, digging into, to Google doing searches about uh, how your lifestyle is going to change? Did you go to down Google that? Because no, there was only, at the time there was only 48 patients in the U S that were diagnosed with this disease. Wow. Okay. So there was nothing to Google. There sure. was, there was no support groups. There was no other doctors. There was no second opinion. He was it. And I was damn lucky that I happened to be so close to New York city that I happened to see the guy. I mean, I would have been blind within a year had I not met Dr. Yanuzi. And wow. that's, that's a fact. Sure. So, I am very, you know, I'm not a religious person, but I do believe And somebody was looking out for me that day and that, at that time, and, and I was meant to be in that place on, on that day. Yeah. Now, was this rock bottom? Is this kind of where this, you, when you think back, the fear that pushes you into continuing to learn more and get to your appointments and now really take a, a firsthand approach? Well, a lot of things happened. Um, my father passed away suddenly uh, due to an accident six months prior to me getting diagnosed. My parents had been divorced and I had been estranged from my dad at that time. And uh, so he left me no money, but he left me a horse. <laughs> and wow. I thought, okay, so now I just inherited a very expensive four-legged animal that I can't afford to take care of when I can't even pay my own rent. And then I get diagnosed with this disease. I said, great, me and my horse are gonna be living together under a bridge. <laughs> like, this is gonna be so awesome. So I was trying to figure out like, what I could do. Like, so I tried to focus on what can I do right sure. now? And I was like, okay, someone had suggested, if you can't see at night and you can see at day, what about moving to retail wine? And I happened to be uh, a really good customer at a local wine shop. I had no money to buy wine, but uh, my boyfriend at the time was a chef and I would save up my tips and I would come in with like $8. <laughs> and I would say to the owner, I'd say, pick me out something amazing for $8. I said, I never want to taste the same wines twice. And so he got such a kick out of this kid coming into his store like, who was passionate about learning, wine, uh, learning about wine but had no budget for it. Right. So he would find me something like cool from South America or the su southern part of France in the Rhone Valley. And so this was my exercise and he finally said you're here so often he's like you want to you come want to come work here and I was like yes that would be amazing and so I thought gosh you know here's an environment that is a little slower pace so I'm not running in and out of a kitchen right. running into bus boys uh, right. better lighting it was half a mile from my house so worst case scenario I could walk there sure and so he took me under his wing and I worked for him for four years until I was the assistant buyer for his store meanwhile I was losing my vision and I had a lot of accidents, a lot of broken bottles of wine in the store and knocking displays over and things like that. But they were very patient with me and right. said, well, that's just Amy doing her thing again. So <laughs> slow down. Which is an interesting moment because that transition is now, if, if I've done my research correctly, you're a sommelier and a wine buyer now, right. which kind of holds you um, financially down while you train for, for so many hours a week, right? Well, yeah, well now, yeah, now, I, I mean, now I'm no longer working in the wine industry. Sure. And back then I certainly was not an athlete. <laughs> right, but that helped you make the transition to finding now yeah. this, this new uh, phase of your life and this new passion. So let's, let's go to that moment. How do you begin to find training um, and begin your athletic pursuit um, and move into that, that phase of your life? So my disease went into remission for a number of years, so it stabilized from the treatment. Uh, I'd gained a lot of, uh, of weight from the disease initially, and then, but being in my 20s, I lost it pretty quickly. Um, but 10 years ago, or gosh, 11 years ago now, uh, it came out of remission thanks to a round of bronchitis. So 
I know, again, my very funny New York Jewish doctor, he's like, just don't get anything that has an itis at the end of it. And I was like, well, good luck with that. So, was, you know, no sinusitis, no bronchitis, no, none of that stuff. So I ended up with bronchitis and he, and uh, sure enough, within a couple weeks, everything started strobing and flashing. And I knew right away this time that, right. that I was in trouble. And I went, immediately to the doctor that I was being treated by a doctor in Connecticut who was following me locally and I would check in with Dr. Yunuzi about once a year to see how things were progressing and if the doctor in Connecticut saw anything unusual he would kick me down to the Yunuzi and he didn't see anything and I thought I felt like I was being a hypochondriac and I was like I know my body like something's definitely up and I and again bruising again on my legs because I was just missing things by half, half an inch and I finally went to go see Dr. Yunuzi he's like why didn't you come in sooner I said I went two weeks ago to this doctor and he said I was fine. He goes, you're not fine. He's like, you're in full blown, you know, in a flare. So back on high dose steroids, this time I gained 75 pounds. <clears throat> the steroids will do that to you. And, uh, and I developed osteoporosis. I developed a lot of other issues related to being on the steroids this time. It, it, they, and they didn't work for me. Uh, they worked to a point, but the inflammation was still there. And he said, listen, there's been a lot of progression in this disease and a lot of research now. There's, there's a really good guy at uh, Mount Sinai and one up, at, um, up in Boston. I'd like to, you to go see them and get another opinion about what's the next step because I think it's chemotherapy, but I don't want to be the one to make the decision for you. Wow. And so I go to see this, this fancy specialist up in Boston and he graces us with his presence with his entourage of doctors like, you know, taking notes and running behind him. It was like something out of that, that show House on Fox, you know, like where he's this kind of big personality doctor and everybody's terrified of him sure. and so he comes in and he flips on the light and he goes yep he goes start chemo this week and i'm like hi i'm amy nice to meet you like <laughs> bedside manner of a posted stamp but um and so he's literally looking at the chart and writing furiously and he goes you have any kids and i said no sir and he's like you married i'm like no he's like hmm boyfriend i'm like where, where are we going with this he goes well it's gonna fry your ovaries so you might want to think about egg banking and he's, i was like what? My mother's in the room and she goes, wow. my grandchildren. She burst into tears. I was like, really, mom? Now we're going to talk about grandkids in the middle of like this. <laughs> I was like, this seems to be the, this is the time and place to have this discussion. I was like, I need a boyfriend first. So like it takes two for that to happen. So literally I had to look at, like I had a week to figure out whether or not I wanted a child right. or whether, whether I wanted to spend $18,000 to bank some embryos that I might use in five years. I was like, yeah, I'll take a pass. I'll take my chances. You know, there's a lot of kids out there that might need homes. You know, clearly at that point, saving my vision was the priority, but right. I had no idea what I was in for um, when I said yes to chemo because they had assured me that it was a lower dose of than the big scary drugs that were used for cancer. It was a lot of drugs that were used in kidney and liver transplant patients that were very highly tolerated, usually taken orally. I didn't necessarily need to have an infusion. And so it was chemo light. And I thought, and they sold me hard on this. And at that time, I was now the buyer for a big chain of retail stores in New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut, um, and really loved my job. I was traveling all over the world, and um, I, uh, you know, I got to taste amazing wines and have these amazing experiences. And I was working 70, 80 hours a week. Now, mind you, October, November, December in the wine industry is a very, very busy time. Sure. You do 80% of your business, and so you're lucky if you get to go to the bathroom or eat a protein bar in between helping customers. And they're like, oh, you'll be fine. You know, you might be a little tired, a little nauseous, but we have drugs for that too. And I said, oh, okay, great. I'm like, let's do it. Bring on the chemo. Right. So I started and I was still driving at the time. And I remember pulling into the parking lot of the building where I worked and I had taken the dose that morning, my first dose. And I was like, here, here we go. And I went to go stand up and my legs wouldn't work. And I had really bad vertigo. I, like the whole world was spinning. And I thought, oh crap. They lied. <laughs> so I'm in the parking lot and I'm in my car and which mind you, I had just got a brand new convertible six months prior because I knew that that was probably going to be the last car I drove. So sure. I went all in. I was like, I'm going to get a nice car and treat myself to a nice vehicle because I'm going to go out with a bang. It was a brand new Chrysler Sebring. I had one when I was a kid, but they had this fancy model that was now made by Mercedes and it had a hard top. And I was like, I have made it. I've got like a <laughs> car and I am driving screw this disease I've got a great job I'm like I'm gonna be in because at that Living point life. Dr. Yanuzi is like you might see like this for another 10 years just don't get sick well I got sick yeah. and so now I'm going through chemo and I'm sitting in the parking lot of my office building and I can't get inside mm. I'm going 
okay. So I text my uh, assistant buyer and I'm like, hey, and she's waving to me through the window. I said, can you come get me? And she's like, what are you talking about? I said, bring a shopping cart. She goes, like, what? So she grabs a shopping cart, she comes out to the parking lot. So I hold on to it like a kid on the front of it, like bent over this, the shopping cart. And she wheels me like a dolly into the, into the store where I worked and dumps me in my chair, in my office chair. Uh, so I just sat there for a while, I'm like, nope, still too dizzy. So I went down on the floor and I'm laying on the floor staring at the ceiling. I'm like, it's going to pass any minute. So security, we have, it's a big company, is seeing through the security cameras that there's a person laying on the floor in my right. office and sends a guy over to like check on what's going on, thinking there's some sort of medical emergency, which there kind of was, right. but I was hoping to just tough it out. I'm like, it's just gonna pass any minute. I'm like, I'm gonna feel better in a minute. I'm like, nope, still not better. <laughs> and so that was the last day that I drove a car. Wow. So I, my disease continued to progress and uh, I got sicker and sicker and I had to go out of work for about eight weeks Sure. during the busiest time of the year. And I was terrified that I was gonna lose my job. Uh, I was terrified that I was gonna get fired because, and because when the, the, the owner of the company had hired me, he knew about my eye disease. He had, I had met him at a wine tasting. I was pouring wine at a, at a fundraiser for a charity that he runs. And he had noticed, I was working on the import side of the business that I had missed a glass. And he goes, what's going on with your sight? And he, Cause he didn't miss a thing. And I said, yeah, I don't see too well. He goes, I've noticed a couple of things. He goes, listen, you're driving for a living. I was driving, I was, I was working on the import side of the business and I was the Northeast regional sales manager for this big French wine company. He goes, you're driving to Vermont at night? He goes, are you crazy? You're gonna kill yourself. And he had four daughters and he said, listen, he goes, when you're ready, and he goes, and I hope you're ready soon, you have a job here working for me. So he hired me away from that company and, and promised to take care of me. And so, but when it came, push came to shove and I got, I couldn't work for two months. I was like, I am going to lose my job. I don't care. This is a family business. He's not going to be really happy with me. And they really weren't. I mean, it was, they lost a lot of money because I wasn't there selling wine, but, and I was on the couch going, I just, tomorrow's going to be good. Tomorrow's going to be good. And right. meanwhile, I couldn't walk. So I was crawling across the floor from my couch, my futon in my living room to my kitchen. And then like getting up on my knees so I can get stuff out of the refrigerator because I couldn't walk anywhere. Um, and How does that like, season of your life change your empathy towards I, individuals with disabilities? And I felt trapped. Sure. I felt so isolated and I felt so angry. Um, and that was, the, that was the low point for okay. me when I thought, okay, I f was so able-bodied and I, had, I was kicking ass in my career and I was like, I figured out a way around this disease and I'm like, this disease is going to kick me in the ass. And so... I tried toughing it out and we tried lowering the dose and lowering the dose to the point where I was on a non-therapeutic dose. And so we, then we had to switch to even worse drugs that had worse side effects. So I didn't work again for, it's now been eight years. And that was, that was really hard because I f loved my job. I felt very strongly about being a contributing member of society. I grew up with a single single mom that had a work ethic and started her own business cleaning houses and then eventually her own wallpaper business. So I felt like I am sucking off of social security and I felt like a loser and like, you know, who, you know, I need to be contributing. I need to be contributing. Self-talk is so important and yeah. it, it kind of shapes our self-worth. What were the steps to get you to begin to get you back into some momentum. So you know, I had this, I had a friend uh, that I met through the wine business. She was actually one of my good customers and she had given me the name of her neighbor who was blind. And I'm like, oh yeah, whatever. And I, I think I almost threw it out or stuck it in a drawer. And I was like, I don't need to go hang out with blind people. I'm not blind. Like, I just don't see well, whatever. You know, I'm like, I'm not ready to call myself blind yet. And, uh, and it's like, what, I'm like, and I was kind of mad at her. I was like, what a stereotype. Do you think like all blind people need to hang out? Like, is this a thing? Is like a club? No. Like, and so I'm like, he has a dog. I'm like, I'm not that person. I like get around. So I bump into things, big deal. <laughs> and um, I think it was after I went to one of my doctor's appointments in New York City to see Dr. Yanuzi and I had gotten my cannoli <laughs> and yeah. my cup of coffee on my way to the doctor's office because I wanted some liquid courage of coffee and sugar because I knew the news was going to be bad and I ran and I plowed into a little lady and I knocked her over in the middle of Grand Central. I dumped hot coffee all over her and myself and burning us both. She's screaming. I'm screaming. I burst into tears. People are looking at me like, what is wrong with you? Are you high? And I was like, I'm so sorry. I didn't see her there. And they're like, 
whatever, you know, yeah. clearly you're on, on something or, you know, cause I literally like just smashed into her. And so I got to the doctor's office and I'm covered in coffee and I'm in tears in his office. He's like, are you ready to use a damn cane? I've been, he's like, you need to stop driving and you need to start using a cane. And I was like, oh, but I'm not blind. He goes, but you are. Right. <laughs> he's like, he goes, D you know, you are in, as much in denial of this as you could possibly be. I'm like, but, but blind people walk around like this. He's like, what do you think you're doing? <laughs> <laughs> he goes, walking by feel in Grand Central is not a good strategy. And I said, all right, so fine. So I called this guy, Alan, and I said, I'm laying on, like sitting on my kitchen floor because I can't walk because I'm going through chemo and I'm too sick. And I pick up the phone. I can't see the damn number because my vision's so bad. So I take a picture of, a, a picture of it and blow it up with my phone to a font that I could see. And I call him like, hey, Alan. And he goes, I've been waiting for your call. He goes, so what do you want to know? I'm like, how does all this work? Like, what do you, how do you get, how do I get to the mailbox? I said, I can't, I said, my mail's been piling up for two weeks. I said, I can't get out there. I'm scared to death to walk out my front door that I'm going to eat shit. Wow. Like, so imagine. he says, um, he's like, I'll come, he's like, I'm going to come over. We'll have a cup of coffee. So he brought his dog over and he's a sweet German shepherd guide dog. And us, and he was, as able-bodied as me, like he could, like we could have eye contact, we could shake each other's hands, and I thought, okay, so maybe I really am blind. <laughs> like right. this is like, like he's about the same level of vision loss that I am. Um, in fact, he had a little bit more than I had, and I'm like, oh, shoot. I'm like, shoot, and he's using a dog, and he goes, why have you waited so long? I'm like, I'm fine. He goes, you're not fine. You fell and broke your ribs. You've crashed your car. <laughs> yeah. I took out a, a toddler in a grocery store with a shopping cart and then knocked over an entire display of tea. And he goes, so yeah, he goes, you need a cane. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. he goes, you need something that he goes, even if it's not for you to feel the edge of the stairs or whatever, um, it's for other people to say, listen, it's not because she's being a jerk and cutting you off or walking in front of you. She doesn't see you because right. I can't see anything on the sides. And so my vision is now out of 180 degrees of peripheral vision, I'm down to five de or two degrees. So about 5% of usable vision. So just a sliver. So I see nothing to the right or left top or bottom of that spot and that spot is disappearing quickly and we are fighting like hell with this chemo to save it and so alan was my first step to he was working as a uh in the elementary schools with uh with kids with disabilities and he was doing all these wonderful things with his dogs and and he was taking the train by himself and he was taking taxis by himself and showing me what was possible and so he had me get registered with the um, local social services and get taught how to use a cane and I had to be blindfolded and I had to learn how to count uh, my steps and learn how to navigate intersections and crosswalks and listen for perpendicular traffic versus parallel traffic. Wow. And then I got hit by a hybrid SUV. So I got backed into by a SUV ba backing out of its driveway and I didn't hear it and I got hit. I was luckily not badly hurt, but hurt enough that my family was like, listen, you're done with this cane thing. You need a dog. You need something that has an opinion about right. cars. Like we are not comfortable with you doing the, your commute, you know, back and forth to the city on your own, especially sometimes late at night. A dog would make all of us feel safer. Sure. Like maybe not, you may, may not make you feel safer, but a dog would make us feel better about this. And so um, I applied for my first guide dog. Ironically, I applied for a shepherd initially, but it was about an 18 month wait. And so um, I was, and then I, I told my sister, I said, you know, I, I can't have a dog. I travel for my job. I said, I go to Italy and France. She goes, you idiot, the dog goes with you. I was like, oh, that's cool. I'll, I'll do that. Like, yeah. <laughs> so I had gained all this weight and I'm trying to get back to my life and starting to gain some more independence. And um, I met a friend of mine. I, I got involved with a, a, an organization called the Lions Club. And they're a nonprofit that focuses on helping people with vision loss in the community. They, they raise money and, and recycle eyeglasses. So I think if you go to the local library, you'll probably see an eyeglass recycling box in every community that's for the Lions Club. Right. And uh, they do low vision screenings for the elderly and for kindergarten. And I met them and um, I met this woman, Carol, who was in a wheelchair, who had polio as a child. And she went to the local YMCA every day. And I was now living in Greenwich, Connecticut, and I had not been able to work. And I've been going on and off chemotherapy. And now I started having eye surgeries where 
uh, they were putting steroid implants in my eyes to control the inflammation at the source, and it was a new technology. I was one of the guinea pigs to have this surgery um, under the, the, you know, the, the watchful eye of the surgeon up in Boston. He trained somebody at Yale University in Connecticut. So I had the surgery at Yale, and it was a success. It brought my disease into remission after all these years of chemotherapy wow. that were not working, and my vision was continuing to deteriorate. This stopped everything. But now I still can't work because I'm at the doctor's office two or three days a week because my disease was very difficult to manage at that time. And I'm in this body that doesn't feel like my body and everything hurt. And so again, from all the wear and tear of the drugs that I had been on and Carol shows up one day because I literally had locked myself in my apartment. I didn't want to see my friends. I didn't want to go out because I just felt self-conscious about being almost 200 pounds. And uh, I just felt uncomfortable and she, I lived on the first floor of this uh, brick building and I hear this honking from outside of the building and I open up my curtains and she's outside in her handicapped van and she's waving at me. She goes, Dixon, get your bathing suit. And I'm like, I am not putting a bathing suit on this body. And she goes, oh yes, you are. And you were coming to the Y. I'm like, I don't think I even have a bathing suit this size because I hadn't been in water on purpose because I did not feel comfortable exposing myself right. or anybody else to what I look like at that time. And so I found... I think a pair of like running shorts and a sports bra or something. And I was like, oh, I guess this is going to have to do because I don't have a bathing suit anymore. And so she drives me to the Y. I was like, I am not going in the locker room. She goes, so she, I said, I do not want to be naked in front of these women. I said, they're all these skinny women from Greenwich and wearing their Lululemon tights. I'm like, that is not me. <laughs> so, right. so she literally drove me around the back to like the, the, the fire entrance to the pool. <laughs> and we knock on the door and the lifeguard lets us in. And I have like a towel wrapped around me and I jump into the water so that nobody has to see my body. And I'm like, okay, I'm submerged, that's it. So nobody can see me. And I'm in there and so Carol gets in, she has to be like lifted in through this special hydraulic lift because she's in a wheelchair. And she comes in, she goes, doesn't this feel good? And I said, yeah, actually it does. It does. Cool. And so we just hung out in the deep end like treading water. And she goes, there's an Aquafit class starting in 15 minutes. I'm like, you tricked me. She goes, maybe. I yeah. said, I'm like, you little shit. What a great so, friend. It is a good friend. And so. I, there's all these little old ladies with their foam dumbbells and I'm like, I don't belong here. I'm like, oh yeah, I do. Like I kind of sure. do. So like, uh, and so we're doing these exercises and every, and my yellow Labrador guide dog at the time is on the pool deck going, this is nuts. Like, <laughs> why are you in the water? I need to be in there with you. Either I need to rescue you or I need to go and hang out and play with you. Right. One or the other, but like, why are we so far apart? So he's howling and crying and tied to the bleachers and just trying to drag the bleachers into the water and we're all getting a good chuckle out of this. And I'm like, well, I guess this is my new life, huh? So at what point does this new love for something that your friend had to drag you into oh. turn into a full-on obsession? Like at what point? <sighs> It Does wasn't it until after I did my first race. So wow. I signed up at the Y for a, a swimathon to raise money for the Y, where you'd like get a dollar per lap. And um, after that, I, it gave me the confidence. I was like, "Wow, I haven't swam a mile in 20 years. That was so hard. Right. <laughs> it took me forever, but I did it." And I thought, "Gosh, like, okay, maybe I still got it." And so after that, I sort of was like, "Well, what else can I do?" And I was like, "Well, I'd really like to." I lost about 15 pounds swimming in the pool, and I was like, "Well." Maybe those spin classes look really, really fun, but I was super self-conscious again about my weight, sure. about my lack of fitness, about my dog. I was worried that the music was going to be too loud because it's always like this house music playing super loud. But everybody looked like they were having so much fun. They're yelling and cheering for each other. And the spin instructor, she was super infectious and everybody's high-fiving each other. And I was like, I kind of want to do that. So did you have another friend drag you into this? So no, spin I class? actually went, waited until the class emptied out and I'd go in and I'd shut the lights off. <laughs> and, and so that nobody saw me and I'd like sit in there with my dog and I'd have my headphones on. And finally one day the instructor busted me. She's like, I see you, you <laughs> wait for my class to finish. Why don't you come to my class? I'm like, I don't belong with those people. Those people are sure. fit and fast. She goes, you gotta start somewhere. And she's like, and everybody goes at their own pace. Go at your own pace. So. I did, and everybody was so cool. We stuffed cotton balls in my dog's ears for the music, and I had so much fun, and so I started making that a regular routine, lost another 20 pounds, and then I was like, I really wanna run. Yeah. And I knew that historically, the quickest way, certainly in my 20s to lose weight, was to get back to running. I was like, 
I can't see. Like the higher my heart rate was, the more that strobing and flashing happened. So on a treadmill, I couldn't see the mill. So I was like, I am going to fall. I'm going to be one of those horrible YouTube videos, the people getting spit off the back of the treadmill. Right. I was like, I don't want to make a seat. I'm like, I'm already on stage when I walk into a gym. They're like, because I walk in, they're like, oh, she's blind. I'm like, I can hear you. Um, <laughs> not deaf so the goes I have the dog and they're like oh what a cute dog and so I felt like a spectacle but that was the nice thing about having a dog I have to say because the dog versus the cane the cane people talk about you or whisper about you or wow. feel compelled to like grab your arm and help you like let me help you down the stairs where they make you feel very very unable bodied or very disabled and whereas the dog everybody walks up to you it was a different way of being received in the world sure and people are like what a cool dog not like Hey, you're blind. You know, right. so the focus wasn't on me; it was on my sweet pup. And so, and like, by the way, why do you have a dog? I'm like, I don't see really well. I'm yeah. kind of blind. Right. And so, like, oh, well, we can't tell. And then they would say really inappropriate things, like, "You're too pretty to be blind." I'm like, is it only ugly people wow. that lose their sight? <laughs> like, is, is that wow. a thing? Or like, oh, well, I'll just pray for you, and you'll get your sight back. I'm like, that's exactly how this works. So, you know. <laughs> It's quite something that you want to be able to teach right. individuals about how to and, approach. Oh, uh, I mean, like I had one guy who was stocking shelves at Whole Foods one day, you know, just shake his head and I could feel the discomfort coming. And I was like, oh, he's going to say something really stupid. And sure enough, he goes, gosh, I would just, I don't know what I'd do. He goes, I'd just shoot myself. And I was like, jeez. <laughs> wow. I, I sort of chuckled because I was like, who says that, I number one? I didn't think it was like, going to be that like, bad. Wow, okay. And so yeah. I'm trying to like, Okay, big, be the bigger person here. And because uh, I wanted to be like, are you serious? You know, <laughs> like, really, on. really? Yeah. Like, but that was an okay thing to say to somebody. But I thought, I was like, no, be gracious. And I, and I, all I could think was like, I have this wonderful guide dog next to me who has guiding eyes for the blind written all over his harness. And all I can think of is like, okay, news at 11, crazy blind lady goes <laughs> ape shit on, on grocery clerk in right. store. I was like, that would be really bad. So I thought, okay, here's the deal, sir. I said, I am an athlete. I said, I have an amazing career in the wine business and I love what I do. And he's like, and he ponders this for a minute and there's like sure. silence. And he goes, nope, I'd definitely kill myself. And I was like, wow. Oh, okay, have a good day. Yeah, was, like, let's I was get like, away from this what guy. What do you say? And so I'm like, oh my gosh. So I love that you're framing yourself as an athlete at that time. Your yeah, because I, was, I started to feel over. like, yeah, like sure. I am swimming and Empowered. I'm biking and now I finally got on a treadmill and I took one of those elastic bands and I tied myself to it and held onto the bar in front of me and I thought let's do this like all right just hold on for dear life do not let go do not let go and I the safety strap that has the emergency stop button I can I tied that good and tight on my shorts I thought okay let's do this yeah. my dog is sort of watching in horror like this seems like a terrible idea I'm like buddy you're right it is a terrible idea but we're doing it anyway so right so I'm swimming biking and running and someone through social media had like seen a couple of my posts of me you know trying to get fit and I lost about 45 50 pounds at this point and she said I live in New York City and I've guided a bunch of visually impaired athletes for triathlon you're doing triathlon right now you're swimming and you're biking and you're running let's do this and I was like how does that work? I said, I can't, I can't ride a bike. I haven't ridden a bike in almost 20 years. She goes, oh, no, no, you're, you're, we're, we ride on a tandem. I was like, oh, okay, that sounds cool. I'll, right. And I said, I'll try anything once, twice if I like it. So sure. it's, it's sort of my motto in life. And so <clears throat> we went down to the, uh, Columbia University was having an expo about triathlon. I knew nothing about the sport, nothing whatsoever. Right. I was a former swimmer all through high school, and I rode horses competitively and professionally for a while. And... So I had I'd ridden a mountain bike in college to get back and forth to classes sometimes, but I really didn't have a lot of biking experience just for fun. And so I thought, let's just do this. So we went to the expo. We met somebody who had a tandem bike that offered to loan it to us. Right. He drove it down to my house, and we, she and I practiced a few times on it. And that was uh, June 21st, six years ago. And I crossed the finish line, and Carolyn Gaynor, who actually lives here in Charlotte, uh, said to me, she goes, you're a triathlete. I said, I'm a what? She goes, you're a triathlete. And I said, that is something I never envisioned being a title or something that I would own as a, someone who was blind and sure. a chemotherapy patient. At, at my age, I was what, 30, you know, 37 at the time. 
was like, gosh, I'm, I'm old and fat, and, and <laughs> but I'm doing triathlon. And so at what and point does Rio, the focus for Rio at that time, begin to that didn't become happen a except, true reality? Yeah, I, so the time that I did that day was enough to get the attention of USA Para Triathlon, the governing body for my sport. Sure. And so they had these athlete development camps or talent ID camps that they had throughout the country, and they invited me to one of them. And one, it was, the first one was in Baltimore, Maryland, and they did all this testing on us and had us do these run drills and all kinds of plyometrics and, and you know all kinds of testing of our power on the bike and run and swim. And I got a little bit of funding for coaching and then uh, Challenge Athlete Foundation, which is based out in San Diego, offered me a scholarship to come out and do a triathlon camp. And so I did that and I learned more there and, and started to get a little faster and um, just it sort of progressed from there. Is that at the Olympic Training Center in, in that San Diego? Was, that was not at the Olympic Training Center yet. That was at, San, at CAF's headquarters at cool. Challenge Athlete Foundation. And so I started racing with various guides and started, I got onto the international circuit by happy accident and was putting down times so where we were fast enough to get the attention of USA Paratriathlon. Wow. And I made the national team three years ago. Holy smokes. Right before Rio. Congratulations. Thank you. Tried my whole life to do that. It's we actually, one of the founders easy. of Wheelhouse was a national team goalkeeper in soccer, which is really cool, right? To be able to wear the stars and stripes is something. It's, it's a feeling that very few percentage of individuals get to feel. So it's a, I can't imagine what that started to feel like. Um, which brings me to the next thing. There's such a, a this under body of individuals who became, become your guides when you travel to different cities and, yeah. and you can plug into this entire subset of, yeah. of people who are training that are seemingly like excited to be able to train with, yeah, a, with, a, with an Olympic athlete. The, one of the cool things about triathletes, it's such a great, it's a, it's a small community, but it's a big community. It's probably like soccer too, right? Sure. And so, you know, everybody knows somebody who's, you know, either fast enough to do this or I know this guy, he really knows how to handle a bike. He'd probably be good on a tandem. Why don't you teach him how to ride your bike? And so you get hooked up with them through social media or an introduction via text and it goes viral like that. And there's actually now there's, I think three or four Facebook groups with a couple thousand people in them that are, uh, one is called Running Eyes, um, wow. one is called uh, Visually Impaired Runners and Guides, one is Visually Impaired Triathletes and Guides, and so it's like this match.com for sure. blind people, and so I can just throw out, hey, I'm going to be in Columbus, Ohio in two weeks, I need to do an eight mile run at 7.30 pace, who's in, and like somebody will throw their hand up, and I'm like, great, I'll meet you at Starbucks at seven o'clock. So how'd you meet Kirsten? Oh. Goodness, I don't. I don't know. I like. I. I did something right in my life that I that she came into my life. So, um, the the Cliff Notes version, if you will, I was training with another guide who was a pro triathlete racing Ironman. And one of the rules in our sport is that you can race with somebody who's an, an Ironman pro, but not an ITU pro. They're two different circuits, ah, right? Okay. So ITU is the International Triathlon Union that is the, the, the pipeline for the Olympics, for the Olympics right. and the Paralympics. And so Ironman's a totally separate brand. It's like a Spartan race versus you know something else, like Tough Mudder, right? Sure. So I, uh, she had raced as professionally on Ironman so she could guide me in ITU, but you have to have not raced ITU as a professional 12 months prior to guiding. Wow. So we forgot about this rule. And so about, so I'd been training with her. I'd paid all this money to fly her down to San Diego from Northern California, paid for a rental car, hotel, all this stuff, hired a guy to work with us on the bike, teach her the skills that she needed because the bike is the most important thing to teach them as a guide. The swimming and the running is pretty, pretty easy. Like it's just, if you can talk, if you see it, say it. Right? Sure. It's like, call it out. You know, right. if you see something on the ground or we're changing direction, just let me know. The bike is a lot of communication, a lot of trust, a lot of handling. It doesn't feel like a single bike. So we needed to teach her well. So she came and trained with me 11 days out from the race. USA Triathlon gives me a call. It said, do you know that she did ITU, International Triathlon Union World Championships last year as a pro in September? It was now May. She goes, the 12 month rule. I said, oh crap. Wow. So she can't race with you. I said, we're 11 days out from a major race that I was a qualifier for well, back then, no, it was, for, for, it was one of the Tokyo races. And it was in Japan, in Yokohama, Japan. Wow. And so uh, I had a full-on panic. and I had no backup guide at that time. But the one that I had was injured. And uh, another one was traveling. So I'm scrambling. So I go to Facebook. I say, I need to run, run bike, and swim these paces. Who's out there that can guide me and go, go to Japan? Because we need to leave in six days for the race to get there in time. 
Hail Mary. I, Hail Mary. I'm like, oh, God, just please. Like, I don't care. Like, if you have three legs or whatever, just, like, ride my bike. So she throws her hat in the ring through a friend of mine that she had guided once before. She'd been on a tandem one time. Right. But she had been a former pro bike racer. She'd been a, a racing criterium races, which shows that you really know how to handle a bike. If you can handle a bike when you've got hundreds of people elbow to elbow like that. Sure. This is not like... Ironman is all non-draft legal racing, so it's single bike, single bike, single bike. So there's no like worrying about being in a crowd. She, you know, if you can ride a bike in a crowd like that and and really handle yourself, you know, like you can definitely ride a tandem. Okay. So I, f I felt confident even having not met her and never practiced with her, like this might work. Right. Or I just prayed. <laughs> I was like, well, this is what I have. Yeah. So we show up in Japan, in Yokohama, Japan. The course is one, the most technical course on the tour. It is on cobblestones on the city streets. And it looks like a toddler drew on a map. It's super technical. Like, wow. re, like it is. It would put some of the the best pro triathletes on notice. And and, it, and the pros, the the able body pros, raced the day before, and there were crashes all over the place. It's like demolition derby out there because wow. it was pouring rain for three days, and they had you know because it's a, it, in a city. There's intersections that have crosswalks that have the paint. The white paint gets super slick in the rain. So if you're cornering on that, your back tire just goes right out. Right. So. It requires a really, really skillful bike handle. I'm like, okay, we're gonna die. You know, pretty sure, sh pretty sure we're gonna die. And to add insult to injury, it's illegal for two people to ride on a bike in Japan outside of a race. So we have no opportunity to practice together. Wow. It's a weird law in in Japan that two people can't ride on a bike. It's like, so it's so they had this fake practice set up for us on a dock, on a loading dock, in the pouring rain on wood, on wooden docks. Um, it was a straight thing with cones down the middle with hundreds of volunteer Japanese people lining this thing, clapping for us as we went by. I was right. like, this is the weirdest thing I've ever had happen. And we were literally going down and back and down and back up and down this dock. And that was our practice. And at one point, mind you, it's raining the whole time we're there and we're just laughing at the absurdity. I'm like, well, this is how we're learning how to ride a bike together. Sure. And one of the athletes who is an amputee, he has one leg, goes down in front of us. He just, he wipes out because it's, the, it's raining so hard and it was really slick. And so she somehow, now tandems don't swerve. It's like, I, I'll call it a high performance tractor trailer. Okay. It takes a long time to accelerate and it takes a long time to decelerate. But at speed, it's the fastest thing on the road. Got and it's it. super, super powerful. And, but it doesn't corner or maneuver right. like a car, like a sports car. Even though I have like one of the best tandems on, in the world, it, it, it's the sports car of tandems, but it still is not gonna swerve around a guy. She managed to somehow not run over this poor guy who's on the ground from Brazil. And I thought, shoot, if she can do that, like we are gonna nail this race. And all of a sudden I got more confident. I was like, I went from saying to her, you know, let's just be safe. Even if we finished last, Cut I knew at that, at that race, uh, I knew I could still get the points that I needed to sure. get into the next race because it's a points-based system. That's how you get into these major races. It's based on your ranking. And so at the time, I think I was ranked number four in the world. So we get through the race. We had the fastest bike split of the day. And, and I'm like, I'm on the back of the tandem, grinning from ear to ear. I'm going, holy cow, that was the most fun I've ever had on a bike. And we get done with the race, and she goes, was that okay? Like, we finished in fourth place, and I thought, are you kidding me? Like, <laughs> you didn't kill me. I just had the most fun I've ever had on a bike. And I said, sure. would you be willing to race with me again? She goes, oh, yeah. She goes, would you be willing to have me pilot you again? And that was it. That was two and a half years ago. That was two and a half years ago? Yeah. And now, we've been racing together ever since. Pole position in the United States. Yeah. Seventh in the world. Yeah, crazy. Really looking to chase down. I was number two at one point this year, but I got, I got bumped yeah, off my throne. There's no time for that. <laughs> no time for that. Um, Tokyo 2020, let's talk about a little bit of uh, fundraising for that. Mm -hmm. Very important for you mm. to be able to get there and, and um, uh, introduce your calls to more and more individuals. Um, can, give us some, shine some light on to how the fundraising efforts work in your endeavor. Well, and, you know, as a former professional athlete, you know, unless you're Michael Phelps or, you know, yeah. one of the top in your sport, and even though I am one of the top in my sport, I'm a para, Paralympic athlete. You know, the able-bodied athletes, unfortunately, get a little bit more, you know, time and attention. And um, para triathlon, the first time it was included as, as a Paralympic sport was in Rio. So it's not like it's got a 30-year history of being a sport in the Olympics where there's a, right. a big governing body that's well-funded. We're like the, in infancy stages. So literally, I'm number one in the U.S., number seven in the world, and my stipend, my athlete stipend is $300 a month. So Incredible. And I'm supposed to live on that. Wow. 
like and I'm 43 years old and it takes a lot to get to the starting line at this age, you know, between chiropractor, you sure. know, like the physical therapist, all those guys, and they like to get paid, you know, sure. like anybody else. And $300 and so, is barely dog food, right? right? right. <laughs> like $300, that's a week of PT and sure. all the other stuff. I'm like, okay, thanks guys. And then coaching, we get $100 a month stipend for coaching that's paid directly to our coach, but my coach charges a bit more than 100 bucks a month. And so... Um, it's again, it's this dirty little secret. There's actually, it was a really good article that came out, uh, I think in the wall street journal about it recently about all these Olympic athletes that are, you know, doing GoFundMe pages and, right. and having to work part-time at like Dick's sporting goods. Cause Dick's is a, a official sponsor for team USA and they give them flexible hours that allow them to train, but still mm -hmm. they're only making, you know, 14, 15 bucks an hour. And that's not, you know, you look at the time on your feet you know, as an athlete, you know, when we're not, the legs up the wall is the, the rule of thumb. When you're not training, get your legs up and, and, and recover. Definitely and not working. It's, it's like, That's everybody right. thinks it's like, oh, it's so nice that you, all you have to do is run, bike and swim all day. I said, <laughs> I said, that's knew. like a third of what I do. I said, I eat like a teenage boy and then I'm at PT the other, other sure. part of the day or chasing sponsorship and, and, and chasing checks. So I'm blessed that clearly I like to talk. Um, <laughs> <laughs> It's I'm amazing. You drive shy. an interview so well. Super shy, right? So um, I've been blessed that, again, with the um, the disease that I have, you know, is uh, and the technology that's in my eyes has given me a unique perspective. Okay. Because um, I'm seeing that I have two percent of vision left because of the technology that's been available to me and the and the drugs that have helped me get here and sure. and stabilize my disease. And so I talk a lot in different businesses and try to get them to hire me to come in and speak to their their employees about overcoming obstacles and finding new ways around things. Cause there is always, it may not be the answer you want or you're looking no. for, but there is always a way forward. And, it's, and you just have to be, get comfortable with being uncomfortable, right? Keep going, that's right. And so, you know, and stepping outside of your comfort zone for me has always led to something better. And it, it may, it was probably not the thing that I was targeting or shooting for, sure. but it ended up being something beyond my expectations. And so I try to do a lot of speaking on, on that. Um, and have you seen any increase in awareness since Colin Kaepernick and his, and his efforts with the Nike c commercial and the campaign that came out really platforming, uh, disabled athletes. Have you, have you been able to see any sort of advancement There's with a, sponsorships and opportunities that come? Not enough. Not no, enough. Yeah. no. I mean like Toyota is an official team USA sponsor. So they're, they actually individually sponsor a couple members of my team. Um, they've stepped up to the plate. Um, but you know, I'd love to see more big companies like of that. Course. Just be like, listen, it's, it looks, it looks good for them to have somebody who's showing what's possible. Yeah. And not what's not possible and celebrating the ability and not the disability. So no sight, no limits. Yeah. Moves into a camp that. You're, yeah. You're Cause I ha didn't have enough to do. I decided to go. <laughs> exactly. How do you have time for all these Since things? Since I have so much spare time, I figured like, why not just bring more blind people into the fold? And you know, and the, the blessing is that I've had people like the Trevisanos and, and, and these amazing network of wonderful people that believe in me and care about me and 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 want to see me get to the starting line in Tokyo sure. and I I didn't have that in the beginning I mean literally I couldn't afford a $300 bike when I first right. started and so I was on borrowed equipment all the time and I couldn't even afford you know running shorts and I was running in you know old cotton running shorts I've had since high school so all these companies and people and friends that have helped me along the way I now know how to to navigate that world sure. and so teaching that to somebody who's visually impaired who's like I can't afford a bike all right I know how to help you apply for a grant to help you get a bike yeah. um, so I can help them jump the line a little faster than I did so I made every mistake and didn't know what I was doing but happened to meet right people at the right time not everybody is as outgoing or sure. you know or uh, able to speak up for themselves as I am and so like I try to advocate for these other athletes and I started this camp because I wanted to help them I I my philosophy has been this, I, I'm realistic. I have a very difficult to treat disease. I've had 33 surgeries in the last six years. Wow. And so last year I had 12 surgeries alone. Wow. And so that really made me nervous about qualifying for Tokyo given what I was dealing with last year. And I thought, geez, you know, I thought if I'm not gonna, <laughs> Woodstock's like, yeah, it was tough, all those surgeries. I got no walks, <laughs> it was horrible. <laughs> it's groaning over here. Um, but I thought if I'm not gonna get to the starting line in Tokyo, I would love to ca 
to, to coach the next person that does. Sure. And so it would be my greatest honor. Amazing. And I And I find so much more joy, and I'm sure you too, like you probably work with young kids in, in soccer and stuff like that. You love showing them your skills and watching them nail something. You're like, yep. yeah, you got this. Sure. And so I get more excitement out of that than I do out of my own workouts and efforts and my, my race results because I think, you know, it's just like, it's love, it's watching somebody have that aha moment for the first time where they get something or that's that switch in their head where they suddenly feel like they're an athlete and they're Correct. no longer just a blind person. They're uh, an athlete. And so I started this camp and it's my passion. I have no time to do it and everybody thinks I'm crazy, but I, I really love it. I love that you're setting the foundation for when it is time for you to transition, whenever that may be, yeah. certainly after 2020 yeah. and in Tokyo. Um, so as we round it out, what I would love to sort of impart uh, through the interview are some of those sort of philo uh, philosophical approaches that you have and that you've learned through your, this incredible journey. So I'd love to ask you a subset of questions yeah. that will um, allow you to just sort of teach what you've learned through yeah. this. Um, first question, what, if you could download into any able-bodied individual a way to treat someone with a disability and they would instantly be able to shift, how, how do you, what would you like to, some sort of mindset that you'd like to break or way that, uh, that someone goes about treating you that you would just wish was a stigma that you could uh, you know, make invisible or, or treat and cure right away? I think um, you know, a lot of people look at blindness, as I did when sure. I first got diagnosed, that it's the worst possible thing that they can imagine. They're like, okay, you, know, you, you lose a leg or you're in a wheelchair, you can still drive a car, you're still independent. They can't imagine what, how isolating being blind is. And I think one of the important things is, you know, really sad statistic, 78% of the visually impaired population is unemployed. And, wow. and so I think one of the things is realizing that um, on the one hand, we will ask for help when we need it. Like, sure. you know, like don't grab somebody's arm, you know, offer it's because it's the polite thing to do, but like know that we're going to be okay. And if we need help, that, that we're going to ask for it. But also realizing that there's a lot of opportunities out there that are not uh, available to uh, people with disabilities, um, like employment for, for being the biggest one and realizing that now, and it's one thing I love, I, I volunteer at an organization called the Children's Center for the Visually Impaired out in uh, Kansas City, Missouri, and I love talking to the parents of these kids, and I say, your child is born at the right time in history for being blind. Technology has finally caught up and exceeded anything wow. that we could have imagined, and so I can do everything that I used to do except drive a car, and mm. I believe the wholeheartedly and hopefully that Tesla is going to fix that for me by having driverless cars <laughs> sure. really soon. So recognizing that there is a way for me to be a fully contributing member of society in, in almost any job um, with, it, with technology. My phone talks to me. My computer talks to me. There's apps on my phone that tell me what color my clothes are. Uh, there's apps on my phone that tell me what currency I'm holding in my hand. So, cool. so teaching people that there are a million you, that you can't even fathom. I have these virtual reality glasses that allow me to see my whole TV screen or allow me to take a picture of an article and then it reads me the text back. Amazing. So all this technology is here right now and is a enabling people with disabilities to live as full of life and contribute as much to society as an able-bodied person. So good. Next question. Yeah. You personify vision, focus, commitment, drive. What has this second half of your life, being an athlete, taught you that the first half of your life never did? I was a jerk. Wow, okay. <laughs> yeah, I really was. I really think I was. I, you know, I was a terrible manager of people. I was very selfish. Um, I was very focused on my career. Um, I really thought that I was the most important person in the room. Sure. <laughs> yeah. uh, it was, I was a jerk. And I, this taught me empathy wow. because you never know what's going on behind closed doors. Um, I took a course that was mandatory at my old company called the Dale Carnegie course. It's a yeah. human principles and, and uh, making the other person feel important, right? Is, is one of the principles of Dale Carnegie and, uh, and the art of listening and, and re really truly listening. And it taught me to put myself in someone else's shoes. I had an employee that was w my homework at my job and she, I, she had showed up l late to work twice and she had been a 16 year model employee 
and I was too busy and too self-important to care that she might have something going on. And I was, had written her up. I said, no excuses. And she was this very proud Latina woman. And she was very private, too. And refused to tell me what was happening, why she was late. And I was ready to write her up. And she, three strikes and you're out. And I'd written her up twice. Right. And so my homework was that I had to sit down with this woman and uh, have lunch with her. And I was like, I don't have time for lunch. Are you crazy? They're like, it's your homework. Yeah. So I had lunch with this woman, and it was like the most painful experience because we had nothing in common. I barely probably said two words to her, even though she worked for me for a number of years because I was clearly, again, really important. <laughs> right. So come to find out after 45 very painful minutes of silence <laughs> that her daughter had been diagnosed with epilepsy and could no longer drive, and she needed to drive her daughter to college, and she was the first kid in her family to go to college. She's going to a local community college. Wow. But because, again, it was probably none of my business, right? Sure. Being her boss. But um, she was afraid to tell me because it was a private family matter as far as she was concerned. And she was willing to lose her job over this. And I thought, crap, I am a jerk. Yeah. Like I never thought to like ask those questions. And it wasn't until I was forced to by this class that I was taking that I developed this empathy. And so that was my aha moment in my life. Sure. And then once I started uh, competing with other disabled athletes and learning their stories and, you know, cancer survivors, guys that had, sharing a room with a guy that had gotten blown up in Afghanistan and he had terrible night terrors. And like, you would never know that during the day because he was so put together and so proper and right. such an amazing, strong guy. And the guy, I mean, he was up all night in a cold sweat screaming bloody murder. And I thought, shoot, you never know this stuff until you're in it. And so the second half of my life, I mean, I am so grateful for it because I have had the opportunity to, I mean, pardon the pun, but open my eyes to things that I never would have been exposed to. And I probably would have continued living in my bubble and sure. my very happy, selfish life. And so now I know that there's, there's people out there that are, have got really big struggles that just even a kind word or a kind gesture can make a huge difference in somebody's day or life. I was swimming next to a kid in the YMCA a few months ago, and I looked over and I gave her a high five because she was like, seemed to be struggling and her coach was yelling at her. And I noticed that her goggles were really thick, but it just took me for a second. I thought that was odd. And she smiled really big because she could see my dog and see me swimming. And, and I was like, you're doing great because she's just kicking butt and butterfly. Come to find out, I get an email a week later. Her mother Googled me and found my email address and her daughter is visually impaired. And she was being bullied at school because she wears these thick Coke bottle glasses. And so I said, hold up. I said, call, like, give me the number of the principal at school. So I called them up and I said, I'm coming to do an assembly about how cool it is to be different at yeah. school. So again, you know, my previous Amy would have never thought to do that. And I would have just done my swim. And, but I thought, gosh, that poor kid, you know, and she's so cool. Yeah. And she's a badass swimmer. And she should be celebrated, not teased. And so like things like that. I mean, the second half of my life has been such a gift. I mean, I wouldn't choose to lose my vision, but in some ways it's the best thing that ever happened to me. Wow. Yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah. Last question. Yeah. Um, such a beautiful story. Can't wait to support you yeah. on your way to Tokyo and obviously inside of Tokyo and beyond, but the power of your dream has really driven you and allowed you to let go of all that has needed to leave you in order for the new phase of your life to enter, right? Yeah. For those that are stuck. Um, they're scared to let go of a life that no longer is healthy for them, mm -hmm. but they truly don't know how or are scared it's to go after their dream. One step. Mm. That's all it takes. Every step is a step forward. I, you know, I take five steps back. You know, I, sure. I call it the cha-cha, but, um, but always forward. Keep moving forward. Yeah. Like You have to. You don't live there. You don't live there anymore. So good. Don't stay there. Uh, I'm not the, the fat kid from six years ago who is slow and, and asthmatic. I'm still asthmatic, but you know, I just deal with it. And um, you are not that person. And you are, the, you are the person that you woke up today. And um, I took this time management course, again, part of this, this uh, le being a leader at this company. And uh, this Dr. Donald Wetmore that taught us every morning that we had to say this mantra. And it was ridiculous. And, I, and it makes me giggle. But I do it every single day. 
and because it puts you what in the right it? frame of mind for the day because you want to start your day on a positive Neuro note. So every day program. I wake up and Love I go, it. I'm happy, I'm healthy, I'm in control. I'm happy, I'm healthy, I'm in control. So good. And I'm like, and I say it out loud and mm -hmm. I make myself, I do it until I laugh and Woodstock runs up on the bed and he's like, what are you doing yelling your crap again? <laughs> and, but I do it because I, because I am and I put myself in that frame of mind for the day and I'm like, Okay, let's go swim. Let's do this. So like, good. Even like my head hurts and my body hurts and everything aches from training the day before. And I'm like, it's okay. You, you do the best with what you can with what you have on that day. You right. know, accept the body that you're in that day. Don't worry about the body you were in yesterday. You may have felt like a rock star yesterday. Sure. Today we have do the best you can. And keep moving forward yeah. every bloody day. And, and ask for help. There are so many amazing people that don't know that you're struggling sure. or don't know that maybe it's difficult. I had a hard time in the beginning asking for rides when I moved to San Diego. Everything was so spread out for me and Uber was prohibitively expensive for me initially and uh, handicap transit was horrific. And just, I have a ton of girlfriends who's like, why didn't you tell me you need to go to the grocery store? I'm like, well, I don't want to bother you. And she's like, sees me walking on the sidewalk with my backpack loaded with like 10 pounds of groceries. She goes, what are you doing? I'm like. She goes, you should be off your legs from training. I'm like, oh, I need to go to the grocery store. She goes, just call me. So things like that, you have to just, it's uncomfortable asking for help. And nobody sure. likes feeling vulnerable, but it's, just, it's not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of strength. Really so is. good. Amy, you are uh, your hope, your, your, your dreams, your, your passion, all embodied into one. Uh, thank you so much for coming thank you. onto the Creating Space yeah. show. Uh, thank you Being for a part of here of one of the first uh, recordings in the studio is so it, cool. it's such a great guest to have in and uh, we appreciate and best of luck to, to your you. endeavors. Thank you. Fingers crossed. Fingers and toes.